been doing oil containment for years, and there's many different types of oil containment out there. I'm going to show you a few different ideas that have been used. Uh, basically, it's like the Wild West. Uh, oil containment was never thought of years ago, and really over the last 20 years, uh, oil containment has become a necessary thing for utilities to do, and it's not something that uh, everybody really wants to do, but uh, it's something that's required. Uh, how long are these systems going to be reliable for? Everything is a little bit different. All the different technologies have pluses and minuses, and one thing that uh, is required with all is there is maintenance, and uh, that's something that uh, companies need to uh, realize and take care of and do it on a regular basis, which isn't done. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, go through a number of different types of uh, containments. The first one here is the pool and pump. Uh, this one here on the top uh, is a customer in California. Uh, really, it never rains in California, but when it does, their containment systems were filling up, and the only option that they had was to put a pump in. And if there was any oil sheet on the water surface, they'd have to call a tank truck in. Very expensive. Uh, time consuming, a lot of maintenance. Uh, next one is oil water separator. Oil water separators uh, work uh, as the, there's a, the water separators have to be full at all times with water. So if there's an oil spill, the oil is going to come into the separator, hit a uh, diversionary plate that basically breaks the oil up into droplets, it then hits coalescing plates. Uh, that are going to break the oil away from the water and separate it so the oil goes up and floats up and the water, clean water, goes down to the bottom and then comes back up uh, through a discharge valve. So typically the oil water separator is supposed to hold all the oil at the top. Unfortunately, they take a lot of real estate. A lot of times in the substation there isn't the real estate to put an oil water separator. Uh, the other potential problem with the separator is that if a substation is expanded, more equipment is put in. They may not have the capacity for all the oil that could spill. Uh, the next there are ball valves. Uh, as you can see, the ball valve in figure one on the left-hand side uh, is typical in a lot of areas. PVC ball valves do not uh, work very well, especially in UV conditions. They start to break down, and as you can see on that one on the left, uh, the ball valve is in, inoperable, but it is in the closed position, so that's good. Uh, the one on the right is actually a large containment area that they have to manually go out and open up the ball valve and let the water out. Big problem is if there's any oil sheen on that water, uh, they're going to have to take the oil sheet off, or if nobody's looking, potentially they open it, but hopefully that's not the case. Uh, oil containment liner systems, many different types of liner systems and ways that they can be installed. Uh, a liner system is only as good as how it's installed. Uh, many companies will go out there and actually use sealants and cements and cement the uh, liner fabrics together. Unfortunately, over time, uh, glues and cements are not going to work. I've even seen as uh, much as actually taking a sealant and applying the sealant to concrete right on the transformer pads and putting uh, the liner up against that and backfilling it with stone. Well, that's not going to work either. Proper installation of a containment liner actually has to be heat welded on site where we actually come out with welding guns and welding rollers that will actually run a two inch seam right across the liner. So it's all heat welded on site and mechanically attached to the transformer pads or to any uh, concrete structures in the substation. The other problem is conduit boots. Uh, you can't just put a bent line around it or any type of uh, thing around a cut and a liner because that's the natural opening for the oil to escape through and also for water. 
So a good installation will also have boots in it that are prefabricated. The boots go around the conduits and go up and are attached at the top with uh, bands, metal bands, so no uh, oil can escape through the top of the conduit. Below it's all heat welded. So by heat welding, it's actually becoming one with the liner. Uh, and then what we do is actually we will uh, 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 lance test it to make sure that there are no leaks. Uh, this top picture is what's called a uh, flow valve. Uh, what it does is uh, if it's just water, it stays open. If uh, any oil comes in contact, it closes. Uh, the bottom one is an oil sensing pump, so it'll detect water. Uh, if there's just water on the surface, uh, it's going to just keep pumping. If oil comes on the surface, it's supposed to detect the oil and shut off. Unfortunately, these types of products require maintenance to make sure that the valves aren't stuck or the sensors are working properly. Uh, retention pond. Uh, if there's real estate, you can have a retention pond. It can work similar to an oil water separator. Uh, just basically burned areas. Uh, this particular burned area has a fabric that supposedly lets water through it. Uh, we went back in and replaced that fabric with a liner system. Uh, that is prior to our replacement. Uh, passive filtration, this is what our company does and this is what we've uh, done for over the years. Uh, typically, uh, we have media, uh, water fills through a passive media, uh, oil will come into the media, it is absorbed and shuts off any flow. And typically that shut off is within 10 to 15 seconds to where there's no more water discharged and no oil. Uh, actually, the bottom can be removed typically in about 12 to 24 hours, and that's the type of seal it actually makes. Uh, different types of applications with passive filters. This is a, what's called a pipe that will go through a concrete wall. The floor is cut out, so all the water will flow into the pipe. That's just basically the housing. Uh, this is the pipe coming through a concrete structure. It works best on a 25 degree slope, and also with the filter basket on the inside. Filtering out the dirt is very, very important. Uh, this is also a passive filter, ball valves. What you saw earlier, uh, this is a passive system that you can just leave the, ball, uh, leave the ball valves open. It's going to drain the containment area. If there's any oil sheen, it's going to actually filter that oil sheen out before it discharges the water. But once again, if there's a full-scale oil spill, it's going to seal and lock. Uh, this is a passive filter that goes down directly into the ground. Uh, it's put in place, it's got a lateral discharge on the side, it's backfilled, concrete is poured, and in those two circles in the middle is where the water would filter through. Uh, dirt is very important to be removed. So in this particular containment system, this is a passive filter that goes vertically down into the ground. Uh, but if this crew didn't go out there and install it, look at the dirt that's in that containment area. It would go into the filter, the drainage area, and instantly uh, cause drainage problems. Uh, this is a liner system used with uh, fiberglass walls, which are used a lot at different utility companies. Uh, the liner is attached to the walls. Uh, this is a passive filter that goes vertically down. Typically, there's three layers of liner in this. The first one is a geotextile fabric, and then a 30 ounce uh, uh, fabric liner, and then another uh, uh, geotextile fabric. So the crushed stone will go down on top of it, and everything is sealed to the pad and to the, con uh, the fiberglass walls, uh, making a full uh, containment system. This is a system, a, a pump through system, that allows uh, the water to be pumped out into a passive uh, filter barrier. It goes first into a, a external filter, passes through here to a sheet filter, and then the uh, barrier cartridge. Uh, here is a return line, so if there was an oil spill, 
the oil would seal here and come up and return into the containment pit and it discharges on the bottom. Uh, this is actually, you're going to get to see how this actually works. Uh, what we're going to do is the water is going to be coming in through the, uh, the inlet hole on the uh, right, hand, right hand side here. And as the water goes into the uh, pump through barrier, it starts to discharge through the bottom. Uh, so this is actually what would happen on a rainy day like today out in a containment area. So the water, it's a, uh, uh, the pump is a uh, diaphragm pump, so it works on pressure of water. As the water rises, uh, the pump turns on and starts to pump the water into the unit. Uh, the water filters through the barriers and drainage is about 30 to 35 gallons a minute. What we're gonna do is, at this point, we have a drum of transformer oil. So, Patrick has just turned the transformer oil on and it's going into the unit. So now he's going to turn the water on also. So now we've got a mixture of transformer oil and water going in. Okay, now Patrick is going to turn the water off and that's just straight transformer oil. Uh, we have uh, seminars at our facility and this is always a big uh, event because everybody is waiting for the oil to come out of the other end. Uh, so the water continues to, drain th continues to drain through. As the oil hits the return valve, it's returned uh, to the oil holding vessel. Now you can see that the water is starting to slow down. And the oil is still going in and still being returned to the oil container. slows down. It takes about uh, roughly about 40 minutes for the water to completely stop. What we're doing, this is probably about 25 minutes into um, after the oil has been uh, introduced to the, to the barrier system. Uh, the water afterwards, uh, we've done many tests, typically it is under one part per million. In this particular test, it was 0.48 parts per million. So that's in a worst case scenario. Uh, what we do now is we are gonna take that unit out and cut into it so you can actually see what the inside of it looks like after it's been a full scale oil spill. Now you can see that it's actually penetrated into the product about six inches and underneath is just unused product. Uh, a new product uh, out there is synthetic ester oil and companies are starting to look at this uh, and it's a much more difficult type of fluid to stop. It's not like regular mineral oil. And uh, there is a media that's just been released to the market that does work on that. So certain companies are now starting to uh, provide oil containment for synthetic esters. Uh, an idea on what happens in real life with uh, passive containments and oil spills. Uh, this particular one was a spill about 200 gallons. It went into a petrol barrier. Uh, the top was just removed because it was only in service for about roughly uh, uh, six months. Uh, put it back in service and good. This was a, a fire. This is uh, in New York. Uh, the transformer caught on fire, a total failure. Uh, the oil went into the barrier. There was no oil spill, so uh, they were thrilled. Their concrete was all messed up, but no oil escaped. Uh, in this case, this is a uh, pipe filter that you saw earlier. Uh, this pipe is uh, in the left-hand picture. It burned for uh, three hours. Uh, it was then removed, and the flange just melted and fused together, and not a drop of oil escaped. Uh, this is just giving you a short idea of uh, different types of oil containment. I thank you for your time.